Thanks, Chris. So for those who don't know what Pinterest is, Pinterest is a visual discovery service where you can discover and find things you love. Who here does not know what Pinterest is? Great, a few of you. Um, I've been at Pinterest for about six years, which means I've worked on all sorts of things, ranging from figuring out how we were counting our users wrong, to figuring out how we were measuring our logs wrong, to figuring out how we can measure our churn wrong, et cetera. But when I thought about what was most sort of interesting and applicable and generalizable, what I really thought about was what we did around building a culture of experimentation. I think a lot of what we think about when we think about data science is around our knowledge in statistics and our knowledge in programming. And when we think about a problem like A-B testing, we think about the toolkit we bring to solve that. What are the right statistical tests? What's the right way to you know, measure all the things we want to measure, to record and log all the important facts? What's the right infrastructure to do A-B testing? But what I found over several years of doing this at Pinterest was that while, yes, those things are, of course, incredibly important, what turned out to be more important was all the people around that effort. And it wasn't enough just to have the right tools and to have the right statistics. What was really, really crucial was building up an organizational culture that was interested in experimentation. Let's talk about what that looks like. If you're familiar with sort of the software engineering community and so on, you've probably heard of something like an organizational maturity model. It looks something like this. So at the very baseline, do you use source control? If you don't, you really should. Once you have source control, do you write unit tests? Once you write unit tests, do you track bugs? Once you track bugs, do you bother with specs? Once you have specs, do you have something that lets you build weekly? Okay, how about daily? Okay, how about hourly? How about continuously? And the goal of your organization is typically that you can iterate much faster and know what you're doing much faster as you sort of move up this model. So what I'd like to propose today is an analog for experimentation. What does that look like? As you build experimentation at your company, you'll keep facing new problems. At the start, you don't have an A-B testing framework at all. Okay, that's a problem. You solve it. Now you have a new problem. Nobody's using it. And so as you keep going, you keep building up this maturity of your experimentation. Um, what are the stages? Get started, get big, get better, get out, and get tools. What do those look like? So in stage one, you're just getting started. The problem you're trying to solve is that people at your company are making bad decisions. Maybe they're just shipping things willy-nilly and not measuring anything at all. Maybe they're shipping things and then attributing every jump in metrics to the thing they shipped, even if they have no idea whether that's actually true or maybe it was just raining last week and everyone spent time inside. So you decide to build an A-B testing framework. I joined Pinterest in July 2012. And at the end of July 2012 were the London Olympics. Also at the end of July 2012, we launched a new amazing feature wherein we changed our category feeds to feature animals instead of dogs and cats separately, and we featured tattoos instead of its own category, instead of being within art. These sound like momentously important changes, of course. And we noticed huge changes to our traffic. And we said, huh, I wonder why. I wonder if that's the Olympics. I wonder if it's our category feeds. We have no idea. That's too bad. We only spent six weeks working on this. I don't know. And so we built an A-B testing framework. Um, for those of you not familiar with A-B testing, it looks like this. You take the whole population. You divide it into control and treatment. You don't do anything to the control. You do stuff to the treatment. You see what happens. Um, it's actually very simple, but we built in a couple different things at this point. So we built in uh, triggering. So instead of just dividing the population, is there a weird echo? OK, great. Dividing the population into control and treatment, you only divide the people you're going to affect. So if you're changing search, you don't measure everyone on Pinterest. You only measure the people who actually search. So that's what we call triggering. We built in things like being able to measure people who aren't on Pinterest at all. So if we send you an email and we send you an email, but we don't send you or you an email, we want to log whether we sent you an email or not and measure from there. And most importantly, we built in a measurement of novelty effects. So when you poke someone or when you send them an email, it's very likely they'll do something right away. Um, we would change a button color, and people will click the button because now it's purple, and they wonder what it will do. But what we really care about is does it change people's long-term behavior? And so when we build an A-B testing framework, you want to take into account things like this so you can measure what you actually care about and not, yes, clicks on the button went up today, but clicks on the button stayed up even after people had seen it for two weeks already. So at this point, 
You've built an A-B testing framework. It does all the things you want. You've built all the data pipelines. It measures all the things you want. It measures novelty effects. It lets you track emails. It lets you track people online. It lets you measure only the people you want. You might think, hey, I'm an engineer. I'm a data scientist. I've done the stats. I've done the tools. Now I'm all set. But in fact, you're just getting started. In the next phase, you need to get big. What I mean by that is you have to get people to actually use the tool you've built. The problem you're facing now is that a framework on its own is useless. You need to drive adoption. I think it's really easy, especially as engineers, to sort of underestimate this part. We tend to think things like, you know, this product is so great. It speaks for itself. It lets you actually measure the effect of what you're doing. What sort of crazy person would not want to do that? Like, of course, everyone is just going to use my awesome framework and run tests all the time. Unfortunately for us, that's not really true. Stage two is about getting people to actually adopt your framework and understand why they want to run experiments and when. As a story of a great product speaking for itself, this is Pinterest for the few of you who haven't seen it before. Um, back in 2011, nobody had really heard of Pinterest. It actually looked pretty much like this even back then. It was a cool place to discover new ideas, but nobody knew what it was. And so our CEO and co-founder, co Ben Silberman, every weekend would go to Palo Alto. He would go to the Apple store. He would change every single iPad in the store to point to Pinterest. He would wait for everyone to go through, and he would do it again. Because even with a great product, you have to do marketing. You have to do evangelism. You have to do salesmanship. Find someone who doesn't care about experiments and tell them why they should. Do a tech talk. Do a demo. Find every PM who's doing something strategically important and explain to them why it's so critical to run an experiment. For us at Pinterest, what that looked like was a redesign of our website. We spent about six months of about eight engineers' time at a time when we only had about 25 engineers redesigning every single thing about our website. We changed all the buttons. We changed the size of all the pins. We moved around where everything showed up. Doesn't this sound like a fabulous idea? You can just change everything at once and totally know what happens. And the thing with that sort of decision is we've invested so much in it that nobody wants to run a test on it. They're like, of course we're going to ship this. We've invested all this time. And so I spent a very, very difficult and long period of time convincing the PM that, yes, of course you're going to ship it. But here's why running an experiment is still valuable. Don't you want to know if after you ship it and metrics drop, whether it was because of your change or not? Don't you want to know, oh shoot, we actually forgot one of the buttons, and so follows are down 40%, which is what actually happened, and so on. And so even though people think, oh, you know, an A-B test is for the 3% change of changing the button from purple to green, it's actually really critical if you can find an important project like this and measure it to convince people that A-B testing can help you measure even the things you know you're going to do. Because what you're looking for is predictability of your business. And you want to know, when I ship this new website, that of course I'm going to ship. I've dedicated six months to it. This is what I think will happen, and I'm OK with that. So that's getting big. Evangelize your product. Explain why it's useful. Educate people about why they should run A-B tests and how to do so. Hold their hand every step of the way show the metrics impact of the projects they're working on. Once you've done that a few times, people start actually clamoring to run A-B tests. If you can stand up in front of the whole company and say, hey, I increased our signups by 25% last week, people get really interested and they want to know how they can measure that they also measured increased you know, search relevance by 10% last week. And so you're getting better and better at running testing. But because you've gotten very popular, now Joe Schmo and everyone else wants to run tests. And instead of you being there saying, hey, hey, you should really run a test, let me help you. Hey, hey, you should really run a test, let me help you. People are actually wanting to do it on their own, which is super great. It means you've succeeded in stage two of getting adoption, but it also means they might need some nudges for you, from you to do things right. They might need to think about what their right hypothesis should be or how many people they need to measure it on and so forth. The problem is that guidance is needed. And at this point, you are the human in the loop. So for every experiment, you'll just help the people running it and help them think through, is their hypothesis measurable? Can they likely measure it on the size of the population they want? Is this the right test to be using? How long do they need to run it for? All sorts of things. For me, this was a super, super fun stage 
Pinterest was around, I don't know, 100 people at that point, and I got to know what we were doing on web, what we were doing on Android, what we were doing in search. You get to touch every single part of the product because you're helping advise people on all the experiments they're running. But at a certain point, you realize that you are a single point of failure. When you're not there, the experiment shipped for the wrong reasons. When you're not there, people don't measure it on enough people. When you're not there, they kind of forget they need a new control group when they introduce a new treatment. For me, this came into focus when I was on my anniversary on a bike trip in Napa, and I had to do code reviews on my phone for some pretty critical experiments uh, for our redesign. This is important. This is fun. You get exposure to lots of things. You learn lots of things. You're a resource for your whole company. You're the experiments guru. Everyone looks to you for knowledge and advice, and you know how to help them, and you get to help everyone, and everything runs great. But it is not your career goal to be the experiments person. You should have higher ambitions. What else would you be doing if you weren't holding everyone's hand helping them run experiments? I should say one more thing about this, which is Pinterest is obviously a very, very fast growing company. So we went from 30 people when I joined to 100 at the end of that year to 200 to 500 to now we're at over 1,000. And so it was obviously untenable for me to keep doing all of the reviews for everything, or I would have gone absolutely insane. But I think even if your company isn't taking off like a rocket ship and growing like a mushroom in Silicon Valley, it's still really important to recognize this phase and move out of it. Because even if you won't go insane, your career is sort of stagnating at that point. You should have higher ambitions. You can do things other than help people run experiments. And once you get out of the day-to-day, -day, what else can you do? So that's the end of stage three. You've gotten better. You're helping everyone run successful experiments. You're involved in experiments across the whole company. People generally do things right because you're there to make sure they don't do things wrong. But at this stage, your goal is to get out. In stage four, you start thinking about how you can teach others to fulfill the role you've been taking on and helping people run successful experiments, how you can get out. In stage four, you start to scale yourself. So what does that look like? You write down the process you're following. What mistakes do you see in experiments? What questions are you answering repeatedly? And why would others care about any of these things? So when I was doing this, I wrote down a list of all the mistakes I saw in experiments and sent it to the two colleagues on my team who are helping me scale up the experiments program. This is what it looked like. Page one. People don't understand what triggering is. People expand their groups at different rates. People's groups aren't the same size we thought they were. The experiment isn't triggered in the right place. People change the experiment a whole bunch of times and don't know how to measure it now because the groups were doing different things. They measured it, it, they sent an email, but they forgot to actually trigger it when they sent the email. They put them in treatment groups without actually putting them, without actually changing their behavior. We had spammers that could do something in one group and not the others. We didn't actually track the metric the person said that they were trying to move. We didn't understand how we would know if the experiment was working. The experiment didn't run long enough. That's basically every experiment. We didn't do code reviews until the second of. Everyone always wants to ship the second their thing is ready. And they say, hey, my thing's ready, my thing's ready. And you say, hey, hold on. You actually aren't measuring the thing you care about. People don't have a clear hypothesis. The treatment has a bug. The experiment isn't really worth running because it will only affect the three people in Australia who are men who like cars and also et cetera. Uh, the, they I want to pause the experiment while I get something right. Well, you can't pause the measurement. You've already affected people's treatment. You need standard metrics. You haven't considered the exit plan. Anyway, uh, as you can see, this ran to three pages in small font with examples of concrete multiple experiments that had made each of these mistakes. And so when I showed this to a colleague, what he said was, if you let engineers run experiments, they will screw them up in every way possible. I paraphrase slightly. <laughs> I would rephrase that a little to, if you let untrained engineers run experiments, they will screw them up in every way possible. So what does that training look like? How can you convince people at your company to understand why all these things that were going wrong are wrong, and why not to do them, and how to fix them? If you have not read Atul Gawande's Checklist Manifesto, I highly recommend it. His book talks about how you can use something as simple as a checklist to dramatically improve outcomes in enterprises as varied as surgeries, uh, airplane flights, 
all sorts of life critical things where the people are incredibly highly trained, they know what they're doing, and yet having a checklist that says things like, did you wash your hands when you walk into the room? Did you count that the number of scalpels on the table is the same number that was there at the start of the surgery and you didn't actually leave anything inside that person's abdomen? These sorts of things can actually be incredibly powerful in changing people's behavior. So how do you make a checklist? You take that list of mistakes, you figure out which ones are most important, and you explain why it's wrong and how to avoid it. So as we were doing this, we tried to think about what the phases of an experiment are. I just made an analogy to airplane flight, so let's keep that going. When you start an experiment, you're launching it. So what are the things you need to think about at the very start of an experiment that might go wrong? Then partway through, you say, oh shoot, we're not actually going to Rio de Janeiro. I meant to go to Buenos Aires. What do you need to change at that point? What do you do when you realize the treatment you have is not optimal, or you're not measuring enough users, or you really want a third group where you also you know, demote search results from whatever terrible publisher, et cetera. And then lastly, when you think you're done with the experiment, what are the ways you land it successfully? What are the things that can go wrong at that point? And so for each of these, we wrote a checklist. At launch, most of the things people were doing wrong had to do with thinking. Did you write down what you're doing? Did you write down why you're doing it? Did you write down what you think will change? Did you put this in a place that people can actually access? Those are stupid, simple questions, but they were the things that were going wrong. I think one of the critical things here is some of this is for your future self. At the time that you're running the experiment, of course you know what you're doing. It's all in your head. You just implemented it two hours ago. Everything's fine. But what we learned over time at Pinterest was six months later, one year later, someone's going to say, hey, do you remember that orientation experiment we did where we didn't make people follow interests anymore? Do you remember what happened with that? And maybe you can say yes because you remember everything. But what if you're on vacation? What if you have a doc that says, here's the experiment where we removed following interests from orientation. This is what happened to users. This is why we ran it. This is how we measured things. So a lot of things around launch are writing down what you're doing, thinking about why you're doing it, and making sure that you can actually measure the things that you intend to. Once you're in flight, people tend to want to change experiments for lots of ways. The most common one is they think that they aren't measuring enough people. They say, hey, it looks fine at 1% of users. I want to increase it to 10% of users. Sometimes they didn't actually do the it looks fine part. They just want to expand it to 10% of users. That's check number one. Sometimes they actually already have 20 million users in each group. They don't really need 200 million in each group. They can measure the thing they have already. So the in-flight checklist is around making sure that when people are making changes to an experiment, those changes make sense. They'll be able to measure them. They're not hurting our users. So sometimes they say, oh, you know, it looks like this metric is only down 5%, but I want to make sure it's only 5%. And you say, no, you can't hurt 10% of our users that much. You have to think about what's going on first. And lastly, the landing checklist. At some point, every experiment needs to be shut down. Sometimes people try to shut it down too early before we can actually measure the long-term effects. I would say if your company is anything like my company, this is the most common problem. Pinterest, and I think a lot of companies in general, really care about long-term growth. I honestly don't care how much revenue we make tomorrow. What I care about is that we're a long-term successful business. And yet, when we think about our sort of goals of iterating fast and moving quickly, people don't have the patience to sit around for three weeks and see what happened to the signups who came onto their experiment and see what happened. And so a lot of the questions in the landing checklist are, have you waited long enough to measure the thing you want to measure? Did you have enough users to measure the things you want to measure? But then also, if you're reading the screen up here, a lot of it is around, did you think about how you can shut it down? So I just mentioned we ran this orientation experiment where users didn't follow interests, and we instead stuck something else in their home feed. When we stopped that experiment, and we stopped the sticking else in their home feed, now we have a whole bunch of users who aren't following anything and who have a blank home feed and it looks terrible and they think Pinterest is completely broken. And so some of the things in landing are around how do you make sure that you're not screwing up anyone's experience when you do this or do we actually have to change the code in order to unship this experiment that we thought was maybe a good idea but turned out to be a terrible idea. So at this point, you have three checklists. You have a checklist to make sure people don't screw things up when they're starting an experiment. 
You have a checklist to make sure people don't screw things up when they're changing an experiment. You have a checklist to make sure people don't screw things up when they're ending an experiment. All the checklists in the world will do absolutely nothing for you unless you have a way to actually implement them. For us, what that looked like was implementing a culture of E+. So if you've heard of R+, it's just a convention we had from Mozilla. It's what you write down at the end of a code review. Yes, I think your code is OK. It will not make our ecosystem worse. You can go ahead and merge this thing. In practice, R plus is an optional step. There is nothing that actually blocks your code from being merged to production without getting a code review. However, nobody actually merges their code to production without getting a code review, unless you're an intern and you have no idea what you're doing, and then somebody will yell at you. And so we could leverage the same idea and say, if your code is changing an experiment in an important way, in addition to getting the R+, plus, which is that, yes, you're calling the right functions and so forth, and you're not you know, hurting the infrastructure or increasing our QPS by 10x, in addition to that, you should get an experiment review that says, yes, this experiment is triggering the users in the right places. This experiment is doing what it says it does. This experiment appears to be able to measure things. And that's the phase at which we would, imp at which we would do the launch checklist. Or later in the experiment, when you say, hey, everything looks good, I'm going to increase my group sizes, but also kill this other group that isn't doing well, you get another experiment's help review. And they, again, give an E plus saying, yes, this experiment setup looks good. R plus and E plus don't matter. The point is that you have some sort, hopefully, of code review process at your company. If you don't, you should do that first. And you can leverage that to make sure that people are thinking about the critical things in experiments. Because a lot of engineers have done coding forever. You put in a bug, it's not that big a deal, you can tear it out 20 minutes later or whatever. But with experiments, I mean, A, that's maybe not the best mentality because it could be hurting users for those 20 minutes. But B, with an experiment, if it's critically important and you've screwed up the measurement, well, now you can't expose those users again because they've had this bad experience and it might affect them in the future and so on. So it's very critical to get things right the first time in a way that people don't necessarily think about of the on-term, long-term effects of changes that you make to users. The other thing we need is people to actually do the review. So we have a checklist. We have a point at which the review should happen. Now we need a way to, a set of people who actually do the review. And so we created this alias called Experiments Help. And I think three things were actually really critical to making this succeed. The first was we called it Experiments Help and not Experiments On Call. Who here loves being on call and loves having a pager and being woken up in the middle of the night? Yeah, me neither. Who here likes helping people and making things be successful? Good. What's wrong with the rest of you? <laughs> and so we called it Experiments Help. It's your chance to be, yes, on call for a week, but be the person who's helping everyone be successful, helping answer questions, helping people understand experiments and run them more successfully. Instead of just doing this within the data science organization, we enlisted a bunch of partners in engineering. That let them feel like they were moving fast and owning the process, and not like, God, these annoying data scientists again are being a gatekeeper and stopping me from shipping my thing, even though, of course, I set everything up. Why are they making write all this crap down? Why are they in my way again? If you can get engineers to understand, oh, I see why they made me do that. Oh, I see why it's really important to not screw this up this way then they can start spreading that culture within their teams and sort of generalizing all of the things that you're teaching to the way they're building. Thirdly, starting out with the right set of people. So you don't just take who, whichever engineer you see in the lunchroom first. You think about which are the engineers on the team who are thoughtful and well-respected and think about things in the sort of critical ways you need of, will they actually question the person on their team who's running an experiment that has a totally stupid hypothesis that doesn't make any sense. You need the people who will be willing to say, hey, you know, let's think a minute about that, and who will be well-respected when they do so. So once we had those pieces in place, we wrote this actual email to our company saying, hey, we need to grow the number of experiments we're running. Instead of emailing Andrea, you can email experiments help at. When you are doing a code review that mentions or changes an experiment, just mention at experiment help instead of just at Andrea to do your review. Here's a checklist for the things that might go wrong. Here are some office hours you can come to if you have questions. And also, by the way, we might actually poke our noses into your code reviews even if you didn't know it. And this is why. And I think this is one part worth 
touching on for a second. Um, I just mentioned experiments help and how you can get help when you know you need it. But I think at the start of this phase, people don't know they need it. They're not used to asking for experiments help. They just do a code review and ship their thing. And so we built a little GitHub, uh, I don't know, trigger such that whenever anyone was changing an experiment, we would get an email to experiments help and put a little at mention of ourselves and say, hey, that looks like you're changing an experiment. We're going to take a look. And so building up the culture where that can be a positive thing, again, because it's coming from your fellow engineers and not from this data science org off in the corner, was really critical to the success of that. So where are we? We've implemented a process. We have checklists for experiments. We have a mention of ad experiments help in a code review. We have a mechanism to do an E plus as a part of code review. We have a mailing list if you have any sorts of questions at all, and office hours for that matter. We have a template for what your experiment doc should look at like with all of the questions you need to answer about what you're doing and why and what your hypothesis is and how you'll measure success. Now we just need a rotation of experiment helpers. And these are the people who will actually do everything. And I talked a little about how to select them. How do you actually train them? You make a list. So you want to be an experiment helper? Step one, read the documentation. We made all these checklists. Step two, take the quiz. We wrote a quiz that sort of had a bunch of the different pitfalls we'd seen people fall into. Step three, you are in charge of reviewing all experiments for a week. That's why there's a fire in the background of this. We thought trial by fire was actually really important here. I can read all the documentation I want, but until I'm put on the spot by the quiz of, oh shoot, which of these is actually the right way to set this up, I might not sort of connect those pathways in my brain. And so you do the quiz, and it's, it's nothing fancy. It's a Google Doc with the answers at the end. It's not some choose, select, multiple, whatever web form. It's a doc. You can add to it easily. And then after you've done the quiz and you've started to connect those pathways, well, now actual people are coming to you as the expert, even though you're still in training, with all these questions. And you have to think about how to help them. And you have to be the person on the spot. And yes, one of us will help train you. You're not just on your own. But having you be the critical point person turns out to be really fundamental to getting you to learn to think in the way you need to think to make experiments successful. And so we expanded experiments help from just me to me and Dan and John to me and Dan and John and Una and Chris and Cole and Dimitri and Everett and so on. And within about a year, we had 50 trained experiment helpers across all of the different engineering teams at the company. And they were spreading this, I don't want to say gospel, but the, the word of how to run correct experiments through all of their teams. And each team now does it a little bit differently. It's become a little bit self-propelling. People sign up to get trained, and people on growth might only review growth experiments and get trained by fellow growth helpers. People in search might get trained more within what's different about discovery experiments or what's different about ad experiments. But because each team has this sort of fundamental set of checklists and quizzes to draw from, and this fundamental understanding of why it's important when things go wrong and what sort of things can go wrong, we've built this culture of successful experimentation across the whole company. And so when you get to this phase, I would say you've succeeded in getting out. I have not done an experiment code review in years, and it is delightful. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a whole trial by fire. How would you answer that? Why do you think this is important? If you can get other people to understand what was in your brain about why you were saying, no, that's a bad idea, then they can start to spread that through the whole company. At this point, you're entering stage five, which is getting tools. When you're in the day-to-day -day of running experiments, A, it keeps you pretty busy because people have lots of questions, and B, a lot of mistakes don't come up that often because you're just not running that many experiments since you're the single point of failure. But as you start to scale, mistakes that were once uncommon become more and more frequent. Collisions between experiments start to happen mistriggering in certain ways starts to become a pattern you can recognize. And so now that you've taken yourself out of the critical loop, you can start to identify these patterns and think about what tools you can build that will solve the simple mistakes. Because until artificial intelligence gets a lot farther, a lot of the hard things about running experiments are thinking. As I was saying earlier, is this the right experiment to run at all? Can we measure your hypothesis? Is your hypothesis even important? If you're going to say, you know, 2% more people 
will have at least 17 close-ups on pins related to trees. Nobody cares. Why is your experiment important? Why is your hypothesis the right thing to measure? Is this worth investing effort in? And so on. And so if you can build tools that let humans focus on those hard questions of what to think about and let the tools focus on the simple mistakes of, oops, I forgot to have a control group, then you'll be in a lot better shape. And so again, there's three distinct phases. And so we thought about what were the right tools to have at three phase, each of those phases. At launch, there were a couple different things. The first thing we did was simplify the experiment API. So this was our old gatekeeper. It had about 20 different functions there that you could call. Nobody had any idea why they were different. Of course, I knew why they were different, because I'd built them for all these different reasons. But people got endlessly confused and calling the wrong ones. And so we built a new API that had exactly three functions. What group am I in? Please log that I've changed this person's behavior. And please tell me all the experiments this person is in. We removed the notion of untriggered experiments. So whereas before, every single request logged every single experiment, now we only log the experiments that are explicitly triggered. And so if it's an experiment that only affects searches of three words or higher, it's only going to be triggered on searches of three words or higher. And now you can do your analysis only on searches of three words or higher, only people who've done searches of three words or higher, and so on. Make tra tracking automatic. This sounds stupid, like why weren't we doing that already? Um, but it's actually a little bit complicated. So when we ran unauth experiments, meaning people who hadn't already signed up for Pinterest, you had to use a special flag to say this is an unauth experiment, meaning use their browser cookies instead of their Pinterest ID. And then you had to use a special flag saying, I also want to track how many people sign up from it. Well, we looked at all the experiments we'd ever run unauth. Nobody ever didn't want to track the signups that came up for it. That was why they were running these experiments. And so instead of using a special flag, we just automatically count, ran a job every night that counts the signups that happened after anyone was exposed to any unauth experiment. And now a lot of these mistakes fell away. Similarly, if you're doing something like sending an email, you had created a gatekeeper object that wasn't part of a request on Pinterest. And you had to remember to call this special function that said, please write to Kafka that I'm running this experiment. And you can guess what fraction of people actually remembered to call that special function. And so instead, we just automatically, whenever a gatekeeper is created, flush its experiments at the end of its lifetime to Kafka so that we know who was exposed. And lastly, we created helper functions for the common things people do in experiments. This is a little bit Pinterest specific, but what does it look like? So instead of remembering that you have to call has adder on the user to make sure they have the created at attribute before you check when the created at date is, you can just say, I want them to have joined sometime after March 12th. Similarly, instead of checking that the app type is not none and you know what it is, it's just a bunch of things that removed a lot of holes that people could fall into. So that was our launch, helping people call the right functions, make sure they're putting people in the right groups at the right time, not actually causing our servers to crash because they're looking for attributes that don't exist on our users, et cetera. What could go wrong in flight? The most common thing that went wrong was that people would add a new variant and not add a new control group. Um, you might wonder why this is important, which I can talk about. But basically, let's imagine that tomorrow is Christmas. And on the day after Christmas, you decide to ship a new variant. And now you're trying to compare your users who joined right after Christmas with your users who were already there before Christmas. And of course, the populations are completely different. And so we add a new control group automatically whenever you add a new variant. We expand experiment groups at the same rate. So if you say, I want to increase control from 2% to 5%, you better also increase treatment from 2% to 5% and treatment 3 from 2% to 5% so that we're measure expanding, again, for exactly those same reasons, all of the populations at the same rate. Never remeasure previously exposed users. People tended to do this a lot. So you would have groups A and B, and then you would realize B was a bad idea, so you'd start out C and D, and then you'd realize, oh, you actually wanted E, so you'd start out another one that was E, F, and G that was the same thing as C, D, and E, and then you'd run out of space on the number line. And then people would say, oh, I'll just go reuse that part over here. But the problem is you can never reuse a part of your number line because those people have already been affected by the thing you're doing. And A, keeping track of numbers between 1 and 1,000 is a little bit tricky. But B, that thing might have happened two months ago, and you don't remember, and it's someone else on your team who owns the experiment now. And so building a tool that let us guarantee that this wasn't happening, or at least give you a giant red flashing warning that says, hey, you're re-exposing these users. Can you at least divide them equally among your group so that that effect is diluted, was important. 
That was complicated. Feel free to ask me after if it didn't make sense. Okay. And lastly, tools for landing. Um, I think this is arguably the most critical part of the whole thing. You have run an experiment. The whole point of running that experiment was to decide whether it was a good idea, but also whether to learn, to learn whether this is a good path to pursue. You have some idea that you think might be a good direction for Pinterest. You try it out. If it works well, you should keep pursuing things along that idea. If it works poorly, and it works poorly five more times with different iterations of things, maybe it's not the right avenue for you to be pursuing. And so this is a very dangerous spot for things to go wrong, because if you do screw them up, you'll be sending yourself in the wrong direction for the future for a while. So the most important thing we built was tools to detect the sorts of errors that were causing people to make mistakes. These two groups are supposed to be 25% each. You might look at 2,200 and 2,500 and say, eh, those seem pretty close to 25% each. This seems like a valid comparison. But no, we do a chi-squared test on the group sizes. The p-value is zero, that these would actually come out by chance. And so these groups are not comparable. You've done something wrong in triggering this experiment. That means you have to throw away all of the results. Test that the groups grew at the same rate. So again, if one day is Christmas or one day is, I don't know what holidays you have in Australia, some fancy Australian holiday, <laughs> um, you don't want to compare the users across different times. You need to make sure your groups grew at exactly the same rate so they have the same sort of seasonal profile. You want to verify that the groups have a similar distribution of users. So we divide our users into these different states. Casual, meaning they visit relatively often. Core, meaning they visit all the time. Dormant, meaning they hadn't visited in a while, and so on. And you can look at how different the population of users is in each of your groups to tell whether they're significantly different. If your group somehow ended up with all core users and your control group had a good distribution of users, of course your experiment's gonna look awesome because you just by chance happened to get a different sort of person in it. And perhaps most importantly, we built all these things. It allowed people to see their mistakes. They would still take a screenshot of the experiment dashboard even though there were these tools that told them it was invalid and they would still try to ship their experiment. And so I built a thing that hides everything on the dashboard if you're trying to do anything wrong. So if that chi-squared test fails, you get this giant yellow banner. If you're trying to compare groups that started on different rates, you get this giant yellow banner. And there's a little button that says click here to show the results anyway, but be careful, the results are probably reliable. I log everyone who clicks on that button <laughs> and what experiment it was for. And I don't look at that anymore, but when I first built it, it was actually really critical because you're, again, helping people avoid making the wrong decision. What I've said before, make the simple thing, make the, doing the right thing easy, make doing the wrong thing hard. If you look at this and the results are hidden, hopefully people will take the extra second to figure out why, rather than, ah, oh, why is this tool so annoying? Make doing the wrong thing hard. Equally importantly, simplify analysis. So a lot of the problems we were seeing were people concluding that one group was better when it actually wasn't, when they didn't have the statistical power to do it. If you imagine you're an engineer running a SQL query, you can easily see how this would happen. You count how many people signed up in the control, you count how many people signed up in the treatment. There were 112 in the treatment and only 98 in the control. Clearly you should ship. But it turns out statistical significance is actually a thing and that might not be the right conclusion. And so we automated a lot of the common analysis that people would want to do. We automatically track all the important metrics and we only show them as up if it's a statistically significant difference. It's also tracking novelty effects. So the left-hand side isn't May 1st, May 2nd, May 3rd, May 4th. It's the day any given user was first exposed to your experiment, the day any given user was exposed after that, and so on. And so you can see whatever this experiment was seems to have some sort of weekly effect. Maybe we're doing something like send an email once a week and pe some people open the email that day and some afterward. And what we actually care about is not that you do something right away, that this left-hand side is blue, is positive but that the novelty effect doesn't wear off. And so even two weeks later, when you've been getting this new email for a while, you're still more likely to open it to come back to Pinterest to do the things we care about. Similarly, people wanted to do custom analysis because they just didn't want to know how their experiment was doing overall. They wanted to know how was it doing on iOS? How is it doing in Japan? How is it doing on men? How is it doing on women? How is it doing on people who signed up recently? And so at this top, we have 27 different drop downs which, yes, introduces its own problems, but lets you do the segmenting you need to do to understand how your experiment is performing. 
still do the statistical significance tests on it to reduce the chance of screwing up. We built special tools to look into novelty effects more carefully. Here you can see it really, really strongly where enabled has this huge jump on day zero and that effect shrinks but persists over time and so on. The goal here is to get tools to simplify the things that machines can notice of groups growing at the wrong rate so that you can use humans for the hard part, which is thinking. The thinking will never go away, in my opinion. I'm happy to hear fixes if you've gotten it to go away. And so if you can build tools that let people think about the hard and important things, then their energy will be spent better, they can move faster, et cetera. So that's the maturity model. You get started by building a framework, but that's not good enough, even if it does all the things you think it should, because you need people to adopt it. To get people to adopt it, you have to actually be a salesperson, do marketing, set every iPad in the Apple store to point to Pinterest, get people to understand why it's important, why it will help them, why it will help the company. When you finally convince people to use it, now they're gonna screw things up all the time, help them not to do that. Help them run successful experiments and see the value from it. Once you're there, help other people help people so you're not the single point of failure. And then once you get to the point where you're seeing mistakes happen frequently, build the tools that help eliminate those mistakes so that the humans can focus on the thinking. That's where we are now. There's probably a stage six. I don't know what it looks like yet. For us, as I said, it's pretty decentralized now, so there are probably pieces of this that are working better in some teams than in others. If you know what stage six looks like, feel free to let me know. But I think the last thing I wanna say is I think this building a culture of experimentation applies more broadly outside just A-B testing. If you want to build a new model that predicts churn, you have to convince people that it's better than what you were doing before, that you can actually influence the likelihood of churn with your model and so on. Everything you do as a data scientist is about building the culture of believing what you're doing, believing why it's important, believing why it can change things. And so it's not just a culture of experimentation, it's a culture of changing minds. Data science, changing minds, one at a time. That's all I have, happy for questions.